For the longest time, Sporefrog and Frogmite were the most competitively playable frogs in all of Magic, followed up closely by Chlamydian Colossus and Mirror Entity. And that's right, I just don't rate Omnibian very highly at all. That was until everyone's favourite Toady Boy showed up on Shadows of Innistrad, Chub Toad got his literal chub on and grew into himself, and puberty was very kind to him. He is now all thick, chunky, and ready to twerk and do some work. The Gitrog monster was Innistrad's premier amphibious swamp or lake monster, a big old boy who liked nothing more than to gobble up the locals gifted to him by a cult that worshipped him, and in his spare time, generate huge amounts of value in a card drawing engine that makes my nipples go hard. I have already previously been playing him to a little success in Legacy Nick Fit, which I'll get around to playing on the channel at some point soon. This week we're playing with a deck being called Many Many Names, from Heartless Gitrog to Green Black Value Town, I prefer the name Gitrog's Heartless Value Town, with Jung being the top dog again it's time to get fucking grindy. The deck was popularised a little bit by Todd Stevens, who's playing it in the Super League and being played by his teammate Crobin Hislot on videos of at tcgplayer.com. The exact origin of the deck elude me. I think it might have showed up on Reddit a little while back, but I'm not sure exactly where it came from. If anyone can give me the original source or the original creators, I'll be sure to link in the description below and add cards to the screen now. Credit where credit is due. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Vince, also known as Pleasant Kobe on the internet, and I'm the Magic the Gathering content creator equivalent of a chicken tikka vindaloo that you've ate when you're half cut and you sort of drop some of it in your trousers but you didn't realise till the next morning and you like go in your pocket and there's just a chunk of chicken smeared in hot spicy sauce. That's right, a surprising but tasty treat. Yum. This deck is so much fun. The deck looks to use Heartless Summoning to allow us to cheat on mana and get a value engine online very, very early. Once Heartless Summoning's in play, Tracker, Ramlet, Excavator, Azusa and Wayward Sawtooth all cost a low, low cost of one mana, whilst Oracle and Vizier are two, and Obnixilus and Gitrog, our favourite froggy boy, are three mana. We use this assortment and a collection, a menagerie if you will, of creatures to play a lot of lands very quickly. This will either allow us to win the game by grinding out our opponents and playing a lot of stuff, or combo killing them with Obnixilus' landfall ability. We have nine pieces of turn one interaction, as well as catch-alls, impulse and abrupt decay. The deck manages to see a lot of its cards and should be able to grind and dig for relevant interaction through the sheer weight of its value engine if it's not run over by aggro decks. Our sideboard is a robust collection of your typical mid-range decks hedge cards. I think this deck could stumble against very, very fast aggro as we look to deploy a turn to do nothing in the form of heartless summoning sometimes. Against decks like Jund, there's an inevitability of an engine they simply cannot keep up with if it's not stopped from building momentum early. In the words of those deluded cult members, all hail the Gitrog monster. As always, a fucking huge shout out to my patrons, the biggest of which have their names on screen right now. These guys and girls are keeping the channel going and are supporting me and making a real go of this whole content creation thing. As always, the deck is brought to you by and sponsored by MTGO Traders and Cape Fear Games. If you want to support the channel indirectly, you can purchase digital cards from MTGO Traders and physical cardboard from Cape Fear Games using the discount code GGGETWRECKED no spaces to get 8% off and support the channel. If you like what I'm doing here and want to support me more directly or have input into what I am playing and making videos around, you can support me over on Patreon. Also don't forget to subscribe to the channel here on YouTube and follow me on Twitch where I stream every Monday night at 7pm GMT. Right, let's hibbity hibbity hop to it. And the grand prize winner, the Hypno Toad. All glory to the Hypnotoad! We ship away this fucking mad hand with triple thoughtsies, because that's probably not going to get us there. We keep a slow and cumbersome six because I don't want to go down to five. Inquisition reveals our opponent to be on Tesserator of some description, and we take his early mana ramp and leave him with an Inquisition that will brick. He fires back at us with his hand disruption, and we laugh in his face. You can't disrupt a good hand if we didn't have a good hand in the first place. Eh? Eh? That's what I call next level magic. I make some land drops and he makes some land drops and plays an ensnaring bridge. Yay! It's a good job we can combo kill him through that and also have main board kill spells for it. To complement our terrible draws with our first ever flight with the deck, we have drawn not one but two of the fucking Gitrod monsters. We draw a tracker for turn four so we can play it and follow up with a land for that incremental value. He plays a Tez that we saw earlier, which in the words of Tom York, is no surprises. We crack a clue and get into kill Tez number one whilst we have a chance to attack through the bridge. We draw and play life in the loam to ensure we hit our fifth land drop next turn. He doesn't play the second Tezzer that we know he's got in hand, instead opt him to play a prism and a Thopter foundry. Can we outgrind a Thopter sword combo? Only one way to find out. 
Instead of slamming Gitrog for minimal value as we don't have a spare land in hand or a fetch, I decided to play Heartless into Gitrog to ensure we can maximise our value and then start to go off next turn. Our opponent main phase was for a Sword of the Meat because instant speed interaction and combos is overrated. I, I, I think. We sack a land to Gitrog and trigger him, opting to dredge our life from the loam instead, which in turn bends another land at the top and draws us yet another card. We have arrived at our destination, Walu Town, and the population is us. I play out Captain Landstorm of Nixilus, and play a land which allows us to effectively bolt or lava spike his face. The distinction here is it's not really a bolt because we can't redirect it at Planeswalkers, so it's actually not like good at fighting things like Tezzeret. I loan back a shitload of lands and make a second land up for the turn, thanks to Get Ramon Monster. Bolts, clues, cards drawn, it's like fucking Christmas with my family, but with less horrific flesh eating monsters. I can't swing in because of the bridge, so we have to look to go off next turn instead. He makes some boring thop thops with his combo, he then plays a Tezzy number 2 and takes up to find an Opal. Not an Opal Fruit though, they are now called Starburst. Uh, not to be confused with Sunburst, which also happens to be in this deck. Perhaps Tezzeret combo or Tezzeret control should just be called Opal Fruits these days. It's a much cooler name to be honest, though I, I doubt Wizards will adopt it. He doesn't swing, instead passing to us. I crack a fetch down in the Zen step, replacing the draw from the Gitrog with a dredge, which then hits another land and allows us to draw another card. We enter our turn with a full Gripperino. We sack a land, draw a card, then draw for the turn as well, and feel like hot butter has been melted and massaged directly onto our lower back by the hands of a beautiful woman. For those that don't understand, what I'm saying is that the value train is making me throb uncontrollably. It's literally humming with excited energy. We play an Oracle of Maldire, which wasn't reprinted in Masters 20 because there is no fucking god. We've seen the Zeus on top of our deck and we get very excited about hitting more land drops than your average Alex Bertoncini after he's played two explores. Topical humour. We draw Azusa off of a clue and play her. We play a forest and spike our opponent off of Nikolai. We play Horizon Canopy and shoot our opponent again. This is fucking great. Two land drops made so far out of five. I cast Life from the Loam and get back three more lands, including a fetch, which is a total of 12 damage. After we play our first land of the Loamed lands, our opponent decides to clutch and make as much life as he can off of this combo. He ends up at seven, with no more mana available. Right. We make two more land drops, taking him to one. We then crack our fetch with the aim of getting one more land to shoot him in the face, and I get greedy. Instead of just drawing a card off of the Toad trigger, I instead decide to replace that draw with a dredge from my loam to get it back to hand. This in turn puts a forest on top of my library into my graveyard, which although that triggers us to draw a card, means that we have no forests left in the library. The deck only plays five, one's already in the bin, three in play, and that makes the fifth. Yeah, that wouldn't have been the case if I just didn't get greedy and didn't draw that card. If that was a Verdant, by the way, I could have got a Swamp, so that was also... Yeah. And as if to taunt me, a swamp sits in my hand and on top of my library, but I'm out of land drops. I only had five. We abrupt decay the bridge and attack, hoping he messes up blocks or something, but of course he doesn't. He untaps, attacks in the air, and then ultimate Tezzeret. Game over. In game two, we have a plane flying overhead of my house, so I'm not sure if this is going to come out of the recording properly. Now, uh, yeah, I'm about, yeah. In game two, we keep a hand with mineral interaction off the strength of Heartless into Tracker, Azusa, and Gitrog. He turn one plays a spell bomb and an opal, not a fruit. We fetch at end of turn and play a summoning. He hits a land drop and a second sideboard card in spell bomb number two. We untap, make a tracker, and play a land. If it weren't for the spell bomb and play, I would have made Azusa go squat myself and then play Ramen Up, but that leads to the activation of the bomb blowing us out too much. We instead play a land, crack a clue, and draw a second Azusa. Hmm. He makes a land drop and plays in Snaring Bridge, which is lame. We make a Hypnotoad and pass back with a clue able to be cracked. He makes a sword and we draw a card on his end step. We draw two cards on our turn thanks to good old Get Good Frog. We decay the bridge and smash face with two huge boys. Unless Tracker was a girl, which I think it might be. Post combat, we crack a clue, draw a Ghost Quarter, play it, Ghost Quarter ourselves with green, drawing into two cards. We play Excavator and he just doesn't respond at all. Okay then. We pass the turn and he was for two, probably getting a second combo piece. We respond by surgically extracting the bridge. He could stop us here from getting his other bridges in his deck by spellbombing his own graveyard. And I kind of want him to because then it will stop him from spellbombing our graveyard twice. But he doesn't. 
he just keeps the bomb up. Okay. We exile his two bridges and get a look at his deck. He then taps and makes some dudes and passes to us. We sack a land off and make it to our main phase without our yard being nuked. I start to play lands out of our graveyard like it's going out of fashion, and he just lets me keep doing it. I play an Azusa and play even more lands. Look at all this fucking stored up value, kids. The juicy, juicy value sandwich. Pulls his foundry to force his hand, he sacrifices his sword, and I go to surgical extract it with my second copy of extraction I've drawn into thanks to this fetch land basically being a treasure cruise, thanks to this obscene, obscene frog boy engine. He doesn't want to lose all his swords in his deck, so he spell bombs his yard away in response, like I thought he might have done for the ensnaring bridge. I tried something I wasn't sure would work. I cast a second Azusa and sack the first one, hoping it will give me two more land drops. It does not. This is not how it works, which is pretty interesting. We slam in, offering a trade of our excavator, and he takes the offer. He untaps and concedes under the weight of our mighty, mighty Wallyu train. In game three, we keep a two lander, which I'm still not sure we should be doing with this deck without summoning in hand. What are your opinions? Would you keep this hand as a turn one and a turn two disruption spell with a block decay and two strong three drops to follow up with? Let me know in the comment section below how you feel about this hand and whether or not I should have kept it. His turn one inquisition takes our abrupt decay, which is fair enough. We inquisition and see he has very very little gas in hand. We take his sword, which is a bit meh because it can still combo out of the yard. His only action is a turn for Tezzeret, which would take makes our thoughts he's very strong next turn. That is, unless he ripped a second copy of Tez like a boss. We take one of the Tezzes and pass back. He makes a land drop and we draw summoning and cast it alongside our tracker. We are light on gas now as Azusa does almost nothing, especially two of them. He untaps and transforms his opal into a 5 5 forever, and I feel quite behind. I draw the third dinosaur copy of Azusa, and this makes things feel even more rougher. I play Dino and an Azusa and kill Tez. Azusa blocks the big old opal, not a fruit, and we get to untap and play a second tracker. Just need one fetch and we'll get so much gas out of this. End step he words for a foundry. Fuck. He attacks for five and we take it, we play a land and several turns too late and get two clues. We crack one, get another summoning which feels super rough. We should get one more turn to try and go off or draw sideboard hate. Or not, as he words for a second copy of sword to create exactly lethal on our end step. G G. It's a bit of a shame we lost this game as game one was completely down to a punt and not the deck's fault, but remember kids, don't be greedy. His name is Gitrog Monster. What fucking sorcery is this? Is this going to be the mirror? Nope. Turn 1 Thoughts, he shows us that he's in the new hotness Red Green Aldrazi, featuring everyone's favourite new unbanned toy, Jace the Mind. No, only kidding. By Love Braid, Elfie. Lady Gay Blood Braid Blood Braid Elf Blood Braid Elf Fucking hell, pronouncing words is hard. Fun fact about Bloodbraid Elf, most people don't realise this, but if your opponent is playing her, she will always start in the opening hand and they will always have enough mana to cast her on turn 3 or 4. We see a slow hand as it has to play things on curve, and we take the TKS as that seems like the biggest effect to our game plan. We turn to his summoning, and our opponent makes a dork. We untap, and of course, do not draw that ever crucial third land. We should decay that noble, but I decide to go all in and put my faith in the oracle. She delivers, finding two lands at the top of our deck. We see another land, but we can't cast Azusa without ghost quartering ourselves here, shuffling it away. I give it a shot anyway to see if we can hit more lands, but we see nothing useful when we shuffle. Our opponent opts to cast a matter reshape over Bloodbred Elf, which feels a bit loose and probably wrong. We draw a Vizia and I feel super bad about shuffling away that land now as we are stuck for mana. We play a tracker and it dies on the spot. We play a Vizia and pass back. Bloodbraid hits Mindstone and bolts Vizia, which is nice. I... Ah, uh, fuck. We untap, draw, and see two lands on top of our life that we get to play. We play a Toad and pass back. Ramen Up is a solid draw for next turn. Stones reveals a Smasher and he plays it and runs it into us alongside the Elf and the Reshaper. Toad eats the Elf and we take eight damage. We have five land drops left this turn, so we start to go to town on his mana base. The first two goes quarters find two lands and the third one does not. Oh, right then. Five goes quarters and abrupt decay later, and he only has two mana available and able to cast a lightning bolt off his deck or any Eldrazi. What is better than a ghost quarter against a greedy mana base? Five ghost quarters in one turn. Five ghost quarters one turn sounds like one of those horrid fetish porn memes that used to do the rounds. Just imagine it, a hairy German man dressed as a priest inserting ghost quarters into an Eldrazi player's bum all in one turn. That's my fetish. We also push his reshaper having it find another reshaper which isn't ideal but it's better than finding a land. He untaps and attacks and we block the shaper with a dino Azusa and trade Hypnotoad for the smasher as he's done his job and take no damage. His reshaper reveals a bloodbred elf into his hand. We untap, kill the hierarch, inquisition his hand to check the bolts and blow up his only land. He untaps and concedes GG Ghost Quartery. 
We keep a super sketchy keep that I'm not sure as to why I kept it. Two lander and two oracle seem bad. We never make a third land drop and die on turn five due to a smasher doing its best impression of the UK's Brexit campaign last year. Fucking us. That strong and stable leadership by voting for the fucking elder Z mate. In game three, we keep a two lander with summoning, but again, I find it hard to really figure out what constitutes a good hand with this deck. We fetch, shock, inquisition, and find a mana dork, removal spell, temple for TKS, and an obligator. This does not look good for us and requires us to play around several lines. I take the noble to slow down his turn to Thought Not Seer. We draw Thought Seas and take a look at his hand again. I take the TKS as I have no clear answer to it and I don't feel great and I'm unsure as to whether that was correct or not. He makes the land drops and does little we make a tracker knowing it will die it dies he doesn't do much we play another tracker and a land drop and he bolts the tracker again and natural states the clue which is fucking brutal stirring finds tks and he slams it in taking away our summoning we draw an excavator which feels quite good here and he draws a smasher which feels better which i get mildly mildly salty about and concede to another loss not sure if it's the deck the hands or me as a player perhaps it's some combination of all of them In round three, we take a two land up with summoning, kill spell, total interaction, tracker, excavate, and fetch lands. This is literally such a good hand for the majority of matchups. We are on the draw, so luckily his opener tells us that he's on eight whack or goblins, so we don't fetch shock thought sees. Instead, we grab a swamp and take a look. His hand is stacked, but land light, and if he misses a land drop, we are in a good place. I take the fanatic as it can kill my tracker after I play it off the heartless summoning. Of course he hits a land drop anyway and plays a pile driver. Instead of killing the driver I decide to tap out for summoning which looks pretty much incorrect in hindsight but you know what they say, hindsight is worth two in the pack of cards or five in the Bush administration's top draw, Orlando. I then effectively died due to a kicked whacker taking me to three. I knew this was coming, I should have kept up with the K but I tried to land excavator and summoning if I drew a land. We are dead. In game two, we have a three lander with one of our best cyborg cards, which feels very good. He leads Foundry Street, motherfucker. We hunt up a decay or charm off of our two lands. He plays a two loyalist and decides to blow up his world with charm. Headshot. We play a 2-3 snake to protect us from his hasters. He plays a burning tree into Monk Fanatic and then he goblin grenades his fanatic into my excavator, killing it dead. This guy must really hate snakes. I hate snakes! We play another excavated snake and play a land out of our bin. He plays a loyalist and struggles to get in. We untap, play an oracle and play a fetch land out of our bin twice, which feels good. Good. Wally you. He plays another Foundry Street motherfucker and can't get in, which feels good as well. We untap, draw Zeus and play her. We play three fetches at our bin and then crack them and slam Ob Nikolai. We hit a land drop, spike him and get in with Snakeu. A double or triple block here would be fine as we have the push in hand to absolutely blow him out. Another power driver before he considers a flunge. He decides not to flunge. A flunge is where you attack with everything possible, turning it sideways and doing next to or no combat maths. Sometimes it's just better to flunge and not waste their mental energy especially if you're really far behind. And now back to our scheduled broadcast. End of turn, we spike him with our land and push his shaman. We untap him very carefully and make our four land drops, being cautious not to punt this away like the last game. It's land drop doming our opponent for three damage. This is what I got to call a land storm. On Mark Rose, what a storm scale. It's about a fuck you eight whack. First hand is one swamp short of being nuts, but even with this much cyborg tech, it's too risky as 8 whack will can really monopolise on tempo afforded by a falter. I mulligan. Another one lander because MDG hates me, however this one is similar to the last hand except with a scry and a turn 1 kill spell because my mana works out a bit better. That can buy me some time, so I decide to keep this instead of going to a 5. I scry away a second tracker and our opponent guide shows us an excavator on top of the library, which is a little bit unfortunate. We shock ourselves like a real man, like a really manly, 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 manly man. An alpha male of sorts. So alpha in fact that I get this overwhelming urge to send threatening harassment to some poor unsuspecting female cosplayer, but then almost as suddenly as it came, the testosterone haze sort of washes away and the relief pours over me like an awesome wave. And I realise that actually, you know what? Just let people be people, you know? Don't be a cunt. Captain Awak casts a mini Bloodbraid Elf and gets himself enough mana to cascade the Mog War Marshal out of his hand. Goblin Guide comes bearing gifts and finds some verdant catacombs. Success! We push the guide as it won't die later to the Golgari charm and want to keep our life total as high as possible to avoid being chained goblin grenaded to death. We pass back and like all goblin players he doesn't pay the echo cost and untaps his mana. He plays another Lenny who brings a George and swings with his shaman and one gobbo. I decide to crack my fetch, get one of my horribly horribly mismatching basics, lol, and I block to decay the shaman. I'm setting up for a blowout and as much as a car advantage as possible from this Golgari charm. Stay on 
target. We take one. We make a land drop and pass back. Again, no echo cost paid. Stay on target. He swings with the lad. And I Golgari charm them so hard, they wish they were never birthed from their goblin mother's vagina. Yeah. He has no follow up. We untap, make a 2 3 snakey boy, and play a land. We got there. He plays another Foundry Street pimp and bolts our snake. We play another snake. What's better than one snake? Or a roll. He plays another 1 1. We make a tracker and make a clue. He doesn't do a whole lot, but as a card in hand. We untap, make a Dino Azusa, and collective brutality, killing a dude, draining for two, and checking his hand for burn and grenades. Nope, the coast is clear. We get in for some damage, and our opponent scoops it up. Yeah, buddy! In our fourth and final round today, we get to take the deck up against Supreme Verdict, which seems like quite the counter to what we're trying to be doing. Lucky for us, it's easier to thought is out of Verdict than to try and counter it. Our opponent suspends his ancestral and passes, and we do a whole load of nothing. He suspends another Visions and casts Semen Stains. His value is coming, it's just running five minutes or five turns too late. We run a tracker out and it gets parved. We untap, make a land drop, and Thoughtseize again, this time taking the second path in order to be able to stick a threat. We play a Vizier at the Menagerie, but find no members of said menagerie on top of the deck for the time being. He uses Field of Ruins to take us off white, which effectively does nothing, but he doesn't know that. We attack and slam Obnoxious, the Fallen, into play. He draws approximately one million cards on his turn. With D-Sphere finally gets spent to deal with our demon, we make an Azusa on our tracker and get in for some damage. He draws his second bunch of a million cards off his second copy of Visions. Gideon joins the battle and fogs our tracker. We find Froggy Boy on top of our deck, so we cast him thanks to Vizier and start making land drops. When we crack our fetch land, our opponent's Spawns by Snapcaster pathing our glorious Toad Overlord. All mourn the Gitrog monster. We attack, he blocks, he untaps, and probably really wants a second wrath at the top. He digs with the spreading seas and semen visions, and then makes a land drop and passes back after casting a chase and bouncing our vizier. We untap and cast summoning to try and go off, which means we miss one damage with Azusa. Why am I so bad? We play an excavator on a sword tooth for one mana each, and then a vizier for two. We play a land out of our bin, and then use it to shuffle our library twice. We then draw the pulse on top of the clue, then make another land drop out of the bin, and fetch a shock, and accidentally don't shock myself, which is I can't pulse one of his walkers this turn. I am fucking terrible. Just literally misclicked. What the fuck? We pass the turn, looking to kill him next turn and hoping he doesn't just fucking wrath us. He gets the brainstorm and emblem of Gideon, which is pretty scary considering I could have stopped one of these if I wanted to. However, we do get to untap. No verdict. Get in. We Inquisition and find a Gideon, a Cryptic, and a D Sphere. We take the D Sphere. We crack a couple of fetch lands to look for something good on top of our library and find Ob Nicky Minaj. But remember, he can't actually see this right here. It's only for us to look at with Vizier. We bait the Cryptic with a pulse on his J so he taps down our team and counts the spell. We cast and resolve Little Nicky and Ghost Quarter our own land to hit a land drop and snipe his dome for three. We make another land drop out of the bin and our opponent concedes. Please note we have 14 clues in play and fought through two Ancestral Visions and a Gideon and a Jace the Mind Sculptor. This deck is king of the Wallyu. King! Absolute king! He starts by suspending a Visions as always, and I kept Triple Collective as I am so, so scared of Verdict. First Collective takes a Verdict. He uses this Field of Ruins to take out our Ghost Quarter, probably to protect his colonnades and set up a fast clock, which I would struggle to deal with, especially as I doubt my pushes in favour of playing more Hand Disruption. Awkward. We play an excavator, he does nothing. We look to get the most value for by playing a tracker and then the land knob bin. But he counters our tracker and bounces our excavator, and we look like we have egg on our face, which means no land drop for the turn and a sad, sad Vince. Serum Visions, snappy, Serum Visions concerns me. It feels like a suboptimal line, but ultimately it might be putting him further ahead as he's definitely ahead at the moment. We draw and play a summoning and then a one mana excavate and play our ghost quite out of the bin. Our opponent despheres our summoning and rest in pieces our graveyard and I have the opportunity here to kill his colonnade, but I don't consider it at the time when I completely fucking miss it. Collective Brutality finds a stacked hand of Verdict, Alliance and Purge. I take the Verdict with my first Brutality. I want to set up Ob Saint Nick as a way to win this game so I need to brutality the purge away first. I play a threat which will be able to attack eventually. Field of Ruin takes care of my ghost one I realise my mistake. Oh no. Not like this. We untap brutality to take his purge and slam another dino. He uses alliance on himself to make a three turn clock once the stompers are online. Clever girl. He then gets in with a snappy and a colonnade which presents a three turn clock at this point. I make a block of a snappy, have an answer to his second D sphere for my dinos but no way to stop a Sarah Angel trap to a land and we fucking die. In game three I keep a three land hand with an excavator as use a sword tooth alongside a ghost quarter. A whole lot of nothing happens till I play a sword toothy man. I leave with this so Azusa doesn't get parved on sight. Field of Ruin hits my ghost quarter just like last game. I play an excavator, play the ghost quarter of my bin and collective brutality my opponent taking away his path to exile leaving him with double cryptic D sphere 
Sphere and Jace the Wallet Sculptor. D Sphere takes care of my excavator, so I just slam a tracker and play a land, making a clue. And then I cast my other sword to even get in for five, because I have the city's blessing. It draws a card and says go. I untap and try to defiance him again for the force's hand, which feels wrong in hindsight. So attacking forces one crypt to command anyway, which would lead me to catch the second in hand, second main phase, with my brutality. I notice this with my brutality on the stack and a path put it at my tracker. In order to ensure I have fuel to rebuild from a verdict, I go to one of my own lands in order to get another clue. I crack a clue in my turn to hit a land drop. I find Golgari Charm, which deals with the sphere and gives me some value. Again, Field of Ruin blows up my Ghost Quarter. I go to combat to bait out Cryptic, but instead just get through and twat him for 10, taking him to 3 life. Has the value caused him to like have an aneurysm or a blackout or something? Because he should have cryptic me there. I cast my freshly drawn excavator and Azusa and play a load of land because why the fuck not? lol. I'd start to blow up his lands with the intention of eventually taking off a colour or off lands completely over the course of a turn or two. He does nothing then concedes after once again letting me go to combat without cryptic command because I think he hasn't got the right stops on. Punt. So, verdict? Well, the deck is sick and it feels like it can end games through a combo where the green-white value town variant would sometimes stall out in mirrors or against similar decks. It is super fucking fun to have a deck that can go back and forth between mid-range, grind and combo kill depending on the draws and the role in the matchup. What do you guys think? Does this deck have longer term staying power in the format or is it simply flavour of the month that people are playing on channels? to meme about. Let me know what you think in the description below. If you liked the video, be sure to click the like button and drop me a comment letting me know what you thought. Interacting with me on the channel makes it worthwhile for me to make these and helps the channel to grow, so you are supporting the channel by doing so. Don't forget, if you have nothing constructive to say, a simple fuck off John will suffice. Don't forget, you can support me more directly through Patreon or through follows or subs over on Twitch. I stream every Monday on Twitch at 7pm GMT, so come hang out and watch us play some shitty brews. I'm also super active on Twitter. If you want to keep an eye on what I do or what I'm up to or know where I'm going live for impromptu streams, make sure you follow me on Twitter. Until next time, some wise words from Digital Napoleon. When fighting against your enemy, simply kick them in the cock to gain the advantage. Alice Fair, in Love and War. What a prick.